Okay. Now, magnetic fields, though, do tend to have a particular pattern to them. We've seen these patterns before, either a dipole pattern like this or this kind of circular pattern when we're looking at currents. So there's another way we can deal with the patterns of magnetic field in space. And so rather than looking at uh, fields over an area, we're going to now focus on looking at fields on a path, okay? Which is something we've actually done before with electric fields, right? We've looked at adding up field on a, on a path. So if we have a path here, and uh, let's say I'm measuring the electric field uh, at certain locations. So there's E here, and maybe an E here, another electric field here. And here's a path that starts at A and goes to B. And I'm going to do a path integral or a summation over a path where I'm taking a little piece of path, call that piece delta L, and I find E dot delta L, let's call this E1, E2, E3, whatever, dot delta L1, and then I have a little piece of path here, call that delta L2, and I add that to E dot delta L2, and I keep doing this for, for my, until I go from A to B along this path. And this is called what? This, this is what? When we, when we did this type of calculation, we were calculating what quantity? Yeah, or, well, potential difference. Potential difference, right? Delta V, VB minus VA, is actually the negative of this quantity. Okay, it happens to be the negative of the sum of E dot delta L, okay, or negative E, integral of E dot DL, okay. And so so the, the mathematics behind this isn't new. We're going to be looking at elect or fields, taking a dot product with a field and a, uh, a length of a vector or, or a segment of a, of a path vector. And so we're essentially saying, you know, the magnitude of that electric field times the magnitude of DL times the cosine of the angle in between them, right? So if you have uh, E and delta L in the same direction, that dot product will give you a positive. Now we have this negative out front, which gives us a negative potential difference. But the uh, just simply E dot delta L would be a positive. If you had a path Say here, if your path is in that direction and the electric field was in that direction and you found E dot DL over that little piece of a path, that would give you what? That would give you zero, right? And if E and the electric field and the delta L were in the opposite directions, okay, that would give you a positive E dot delta L uh, but then if you were finding the potential difference, that would be ne uh, negative because you're, uh, excuse me, that would give you a negative E dot delta L, but a positive potential difference because of this sign flip out front, okay? So I'm just reminding you of a type of calculation that we've done before, but now we're going to do this for magnetic fields. So let's take a look at a current. So let's say we have a current. And let's say I have a wire coming out towards us. So I'm going to draw a circle with a dot in it, giving us direction of conventional current coming out towards us. Okay. What's the pattern of magnetic field look like? So in other words, if I draw an op if I have an observation location there, what's the direction of the magnetic field? Up. Yeah, up. Thank you. Up. What is it there? Everybody, point. That, yep. What about here? Down, okay. And here, right. And so you have things in between, right. And I'm drawing these observation locations at a single distance away 
constant distance away from the uh, from the uh, current here. So I could draw a circle, right? And so if I have a circle of some radius, and I'm looking at the elect excuse me the magnetic field on pieces of that circle, then we have this pattern of magnetic field that sort of is tangent to that circle at every point. Well, what I'm going to do is think about that, that circle. Think about that path. And let's look at a question here. Imagine doing the exact same thing we did for electric fields when we were, tra when we were trying to calculate potential differences. We're doing the same thing now with the path integral of magnetic field uh, along a closed path. Okay. By the way, what's the path integral of electric field along a closed path? If I made a full circle and calculated E dot delta L over a closed path, what should I get? Should get zero, right? This is the round trip potential difference. Right, round trip potential difference gives me zero. Now, coming up in the next chapter, we'll see that that's not true. But we'll save that for next time. But we know something about that result. Uh, clearly, it's not going to be zero here, right? Because we have this sort of circular pattern of magnetic field, which we said for electric field, at least so far, we said it was impossible. We'll see exceptions to that later. So think about calculating or how you would calculate this B dot delta L. Okay, We're dividing the path up into pieces and calculating that dot product of B and that path vector over each piece. If you choose your path direction to be counterclockwise, what sign are you going to get for the result? Okay, you're going to get a positive, right? You're going to get a positive. And be careful here, we, we're not calculating, you know, the potential difference had this negative sign out front. We're just calculating B dot delta L and adding up all the B dot delta Ls. So you're just thinking about doing the dot product by dividing that path into little pieces, right? And I'm choosing the direction of those pieces to be counterclockwise. So if I start here, for example, and I choose a little segment of this circular path, that delta L is in that direction. I have two vectors that are in the same direction. So when I find B dot delta L, I have the magnitude of B times the magnitude of delta L times the cosine of what angle? Zero. Okay, cosine of zero is one. And then I do it again for a segment along here, right? And that delta L is in the same direction as that magnetic field on average over that little uh, piece of segment. And so I get a B dot delta L. Again, that's going to give me a positive number because, again, the cosine of 0 is 1. And I do it again. right? I do it at the top here. And delta L is now pointing that way. And so it's, again, in the same direction as B. And I keep doing this, and I uh, get a net positive result for this path integral. Okay. What if I have the same path and I'm going to choose by convention just the same direction. I'm just going to choose a, a counterclockwise path for reference. So there I'm just again breaking up all these delta L's. But now I have inside of this path a current that's pointing into the board. What's going to happen? First of all, what's going to be the pattern of magnetic field? What would be the mag magnetic field direction there? Down. Over here. Up. Here. Right. Down here. Left. So. The direction is opposite of what we had before. So if I do this same path integral, what am I going to get? I get a negative this time. Okay. So somehow this path integral, if I assign a directionality here, if I say, okay, coming out towards us, I'm going to call that the positive direction. 
going into the board here, I'm going to call that the negative direction, then I can associate that path integral with the di direction of the current inside. So this leads to something called Ampere's Law. which says that the integral, the path integral of B dot DL over a closed loop or a closed path, loop essentially, tells you something about the current that's going through that loop or piercing that loop. And the way we can think of this, well, I'll just write it out. It's equal to a constant mu naught times I enclosed. First of all, mu naught, you know, mu naught over 4 pi is 1 times 10 to the minus 7, so mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. What do we mean by I enclosed? Well, if you think about this surface, I'm going to erase the current for just a second. You can think about sort of stretching a film or a surface or a skin over this closed path. And then the enclosed current is how much current is piercing through the film that you've stretched over. So kind of like if you had a, uh, if you're blowing bubbles, you had a, one of those little bubble dippers. You have a closed surface, it's hollow, and you dip it into a soap and it comes out with a soap film stretched over the, over the loop. You can think of this as a soap film, right? And if there's any current that's going to pierce through the soap film and then break it, then that's the current that is enclosed, okay? So in this case, I have current enclosed, and I get a non-zero contribution, and it's positive in this case. Uh, here I stretch the film over this surface. I have a current enclosed. I do the path integral, and I end up getting in the a negative value telling me the current's going in in this particular case. But I still have current piercing through that through that surface. Okay. So let's just see what it would tell us in this particular case. Um, here's the magnetic field. And let's say I have a loop of radius R, okay? And the Ampere's law, or this path integral, we already said that no matter what piece of the path I choose, I get the magnetic field and delta L in the same direction. What else do you know about the magnetic field? Everywhere at the same distance away, everywhere along that closed loop, the magnitude of the magnetic field should be the same, right? So I can bring it out of the integral. And I can say the magnetic field magnitude times this closed integral of dl by Ampere's law is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. Okay? What's this going to boil down to? If I if I calculate it's the circumference, right? And just summing up all the delta L's around the path. I just add up all that path length, it's just the circumference. And the circumference is equal to what? 2 pi times r is equal to mu naught times i enclosed. So b is going to be equal to mu naught times i enclosed over 2 times pi times r. Well, let's see if we could check that. Uh, a long time ago, we looked at the magnetic field due to a very long straight wire. And we found the magnetic field in that case by breaking up the wire into lots and lots of little pieces. So there was a delta L, and this had some conventional current running through it, capital I. And we use the Biot-Savart law, which is delta B in the 
for the case of currents for short segments of a current carrying wire, it's delta B is equal to mu naught over 4 pi I delta L cross R hat over the magnitude of R squared. And then what you do is you add up all those delta Bs. And you have to go through, you know, finding the R vector for each of those individual segments and then putting this in terms of an integration variable and then summing up over the integration variable. And what we found, the result we found for a long straight wire was uh, what? It was mu naught over 4 pi 2i over r, right? Well, guess what? It's the same thing. Cancel out this factor of 2, mu naught i over 2 pi r. So it looks like it's giving us the same result, which is good, okay? So this is how it's worked how it's working. Ampere's law is different from Gauss's law and now we're in that we're not talking about calculating the, uh, the fields over an area. We're talking about calculating the fields over a path, much like we did for potential differences. Okay, so this, this isn't a flux. There's no real name for this thing other than just the path integral of magnetic field over a closed loop. Okay, there's no special name for it. But just re keep in mind it's not flux. It's just the analog to finding potential difference in some sense because you're taking magnetic field over a path instead of electric field over a path. 